the organizers really laid out quite a challenge for us. So they talk about a global action platform. They talk about abundance. So the first thing that I will try to do is really try to break down for us how abundance, how the theme of this conference is related to competitiveness and how competitiveness in turn requires us to think much more about regions and think much more about, about, about clusters, about collaboration in local regions, in states, in other regions to really make a progress and create the foundations that ultimately can create the prosperity and then the abundance that we are looking for. I'll also try to talk a little bit about how we thought about the structure of the programs, trying to advertise a little bit the four sessions that we have tomorrow and try to give you a sense of what is the logic behind the structure. Now, if you discuss competitiveness nowadays in the United States, it's not about abundance. It's also about anxiety. It's about where we stand today. Part of that is international, and it really started already before the global financial crisis. It started with the concern that the U.S., the leading economy in the world, was kind of losing its track against countries like China. They were becoming closer, they were investing also in research and innovation, and they were breathing down our neck. Now, that happened before, it happened with Japan, and uh, still people now sense that there is a different global environment around us. The supremacy of the U.S. economy is not a given anymore. But the concerns are not only international. I think the concerns are also domestic. And, and Scott, you actually mentioned that uh, earlier today in your lunchtime speak. There is a concern that even though if GDP growth at the top line level is kind of okay, it's not great, but it's okay, are we still seeing the opportunities for the average American? There are a lot of concerns about inequality. There are a lot of concerns about jobs, about the ability kind of to really to live the American dream, to come up for an average person to make his or her mark uh, uh, throughout life. So there is a lot of concerns around there in the U.S., and that created really uh, an effort at Harvard Business School that was founded uh, three, four years ago to really tackle head-on the issue of U.S. competitiveness. Now, the business school at Harvard is not focused usually on public policy. What we're focused on is educating leaders mainly in the private sector. So our specific tack was trying to understand how private sector leaders think about competitiveness and think with them about what they can do to really have an impact, to make things better, to not just wait for the politicians and for the public sector to do so. So first of all, we went out and we asked for the first time all of our alumni how they see U.S. competitiveness. Now, these are people that make decisions all the time about where they want to invest and how they want to invest. So this gives you a pretty good sense of where the U.S. stands. And the answers we got were not very encouraging. So you can't read the details here. The only thing you should know, you know, you want to be to the right and you want to be at the top. So these are the things where the U.S. is perceived as strong and improving. There are very few areas there. In fact, clusters is one of them, so it will be interesting for us to ponder about. But there are many areas where the U.S. seems to be losing uh, a lot of uh, uh, attraction in terms of advantages compared to other locations in the global economy. And then we ask another thing. So if you look at what your company did, we asked our alumni, and looked at for certain locational decisions where the U.S. was a contender, how did that turn out and who did you compete with? Well, first of all, we found that the U.S. is basically competing with the entire world. Different, comp uh, different locations, of course, but it's the entire range, largely still the advanced economies, but also these new economies. And what we did find is that uh, the U.S. is increasingly losing these decisions. So what you see here is that the U.S. loses five out of six offshoring decisions, three out of, uh, two out of three location decisions. So situations where companies consider whether to put a new activity in the U.S. or some other locations, two-thirds go somewhere else. Situations where companies think about, should we take an activity from the U.S. and take it somewhere else, that happens in five out of six cases, and only in one out of six the activity uh, stays here. So that's a pretty alarming picture. Basically, people said, you know, right now we're in an okay state, but we need to do something. And of course, it doesn't stop there, but then the question is, by whom? <laughs> 
action doesn't happen automatically. It needs leadership by someone. And the natural first point to start for many people in this debate is to look at Washington and say, okay, so what should the federal government do? And there is a good list here. I think these are all res reasonable issues, you know, immigration, tax code, um, trading system, regulation, and so on, lo logistical infrastructure. I, don't I won't go into detail uh, into that. If you're interested, you know, there is a whole website. Uh, HBS focuses on that. Um, so there are things that Washington needs to do. Now, unfortunately, increasingly Americans get the impression that there is nothing happening in Washington. We know what the agenda is, but there's no progress in implementing it. And that has to do with politics, and you know, that's a, a different logic, also valuable, important logic. And so we also ask the business leaders, how do you think about these priorities? And what's kind of your political affiliation? And again, you can't read the numbers, but essentially there is wide agreement among business leaders, whether or not they have a Republican bent or a Democratic bent, on what these priorities are. There are some differences, but broadly there is agreement on what Washington needs to do. Now that's a somewhat sobering picture, you know, broad agreement in society and business leaders, what needs to do, uh, be, be done. Um, we can only hope that uh, uh, action will materialize in Washington. But what we also realize in this process is that we can't wait for that. That a lot of the action is actually not happening in Washington. That a lot of the action is happening locally in regions and states and cities across the country. And the reason is that if you look at economic outcomes, including locational decisions, federal policy plays an important role, but so does the local context, and so do local activities, local actions, whether it's policy, whether it's university, whether it's business leaders that take actions. So we wanted to look a little bit more at that. That this matters is what you clearly see in the data. Again, you know, this is a, a, a scattershot of U.S. states. It could be other regions. We're going to think about what the right region is to, to think about a little bit later. But what you see is there is a huge difference in terms of performance across U.S. locations. Some are doing well. Some are doing poorly. Some are rich. Some are not so rich. And they all work in the same federal policy environment. So we need to understand much more the role of regions. Now, one important work that our uh, institute deals with is the evidence of clusters. So what we find is that one of the key issues when you want to understand why some locations are doing well and others don't do that well is that there are regions that specialize. They specialize in groups of related industries, and that specialization, that focus of a related set of industries seems to have positive benefits. Now, of course, Mike Porter in 1990 wrote the uh, uh, well-written uh, uh, red book, Competitive Advantage of Nations, and this was all about that. It was kind of looking at this idea of clusters, which had been around for a long time, and transferring it into the modern economy. Now, what we've been able to do recently is really to use not only case studies, good stories, but hard data, quantitative economic data to show these effects. And what we see is that regions that do have strong clusters, they perform better in terms of wages, in terms of productivity, in terms of innovation. They also pr uh, perform better in terms of entrepreneurship. Scott Stern from MIT will probably talk about that tomorrow a little bit. And they give you a sense about how the direction of structural ch change is turning. Many states tried biotech and failed. What we found is that if you want to determine whether or not a location has a shot at a new industry, you need to understand what they're currently doing and what the linkage is between what exists and what you want to create ultimately is. Now, that's just a description of what clusters are. Clusters uh, evolve in the marketplace. There is no government involvement. They happen na naturally, and they have done so for many years. So what's the role for economic policy? Well, first of all, a lot of the time, and we're going to hear about yeah, that uh, tomorrow from MassMatic, the medical, de medical device industry in, in, in Boston, these underlying factors brought companies in the place, but that didn't, didn't get them to work together. So that doesn't happen automatically. It requires somebody to take action. It doesn't need to be government, but can be government. We also see that how good these clusters are depends on a lot of the policy decisions that shape the business environment in which these clusters operate. So there is a role for government. There is a role, first of all, in thinking about the general economic development policies and understanding how they impact the performance of the clusters that you have in your location. Don't just think about generally cross-the-board stuff. Think about how it affects specific sectors. And the second element is, how can you stimulate the collaboration? How can you create action platforms that really make sure that people work together to shift the needle 
on how good a cluster is and how good the companies are to, to, to leverage the potential that exists. Again, that doesn't need to be government. Many times it can be universities or it can be the leadership of individual entrepreneurs, but government might have a role in engaging with these groups. Over the last few years, uh, these type of ideas have been implemented in many parts of the world, partly also in the United States. And there are some, re some learnings that are emerging. We know that uh, it is important to really have economic activity underneath the cluster organization. It doesn't make sense to start a biotech cluster if there are no biotech firms. This is what we call wishful thinking clusters. They have no impact. In fact, they just waste money. But if there is a, a set of companies, that's something, we, uh, something what you can do. Don't try to limit the membership. Be open to everybody who thinks they can contribute and benefit. Don't exclude foreign companies. Don't exclude large companies. They are often important players. Have private sector leaderships in terms of setting the agenda. In Europe, where uh, I spend a lot of my time, we've made too many times the mistake that government tries to be the better entrepreneur and tell the companies what to do. It doesn't work. You need an organization that has a well-educated cluster manager and a good staff because, again, collaboration doesn't happen automatically. Number, somebody needs to step up and needs to sustain it over time. So this is a th some of the things that we've learned. We have a global network called TCI, which I have the honor of being the president of at the moment. It's a professor professional network of people that really try to learn what these things are about. It's no more about are clusters a good idea, yes or not. But how can we effectively make a difference on the ground and make sure that you are among those initiatives that are doing better? Now, what's the situation in the United States? And that's a subjective view from the outside. So we'll, be, we'll certainly be debating these issues. So first of all, clusters are being used a lot in analysis, trying to understand regional and local economies. Um, there are some cluster organizations, but not that many. We heard from some tomorrow that do this work. The ones that exist actually often have a very deep experience on what works and what doesn't work. So we need to think about how we leverage that a little bit more. Clusters are used by a broader range of organizations, often not under the name clusters, but basically this idea that location matters, that it's related industries, and that's collaboration. Linkages, that's a, a theme that is emerging more in the economic development practice as well. State governments have moved into this a little bit, but often without any sustained effort. So they've tried it maybe for one administration, but then they reinvented the wheel and nothing sustained came out of it. So there the track record is, despite the, the events of the, uh, that were done at the NGA and so on, a little bit more limited. Federal government has been very skeptical for a long time. And only now that the economic evidence is on the table, I think there has been a shift. And so over the last few years, we have seen a number of new programs, I6, the Jobs Accelerator, and so on, that basically draw on the idea of clusters. And so tomorrow we'll talk about that experience and see how that matches up with what others have done in the past. Overall, this is a community that's pretty dispersed. We're not that organized. Um, we'll hear from Emiliano a little bit about the situation in Europe, but that is quite different. So what I think we need to do is take better stock of what we've learned, the good and the bad, and then make sure that we share these knowledge a little bit more systematically and move it into action. So that's the background for the, for the four sessions tomorrow. We'll have two in the morning where we first look at the experience from cluster organizations and from regional organizations that use clusters in their efforts. And I think they're all excellent examples to learn from. They have many successes, but they will share with us also the challenges, the areas where it's more difficult to come through. And in the afternoon, we'll look at the experience of these new federally funded programs, see how that's working out. Now, there, there the time period is shorter. And then at the end, we'll try to pull it together in our final panel. We'll try to see what are the learnings. First of all, for federal government. If federal government wants to continue on this track, how should they be doing it in the future based on the experience that exists on the ground? But I think also for us, is this a, communi a community that could benefit from organizing itself a little bit more and exchanging practices much more than it has been doing in the past? So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today, very much looking forward to the events of tomorrow. Thank you.